Hey everyone, David Tennant is back as the time-travelling space adventure person, The Doctor. And Russell T Davies is back as Doctor Who showrunner. Oh my god, it's like it's 2008 all over again. I'm 17, my feet don't hurt yet, no one will talk to me, and everybody's facing financial oblivion. It's like I've time-travelled in real life. Anyway, so everyone seems to be under the impression that the current state of grace that we're experiencing within the Doctor Who fandom is going to be the new status quo, but personally I don't see it lasting that long past 2024, and that's because I've been here before. You thought all the pointless arguments were over, didn't you? They're only just beginning. I reminded people in a video I made back when they announced his return, and people tend to forget this now, but when something is as stupefyingly popular as the Russell T Davies era of Doctor Who was, obsessive nerds like the one that I was are just pre-programmed to be incapable of calling it good. There was this sense among Doctor Who nerds starting around Season 3 that because Russell had made the show palatable for a wide audience, you know, these were actual characters with feelings and everything now, beyond, I think it would be a bad thing if the world got taken over by fish people and we should stop them. No, the characters actually had wants and needs and relationships. There was this sense of stolen valour. Doctor Who used to be the sort of show that only us true nerds would understand, but by making it so the cool kids would be able to get into it too, that was reason enough to start shitting on Russell's reboot of the show, whether said reasons were actually valid or not. This practice slowly got forgotten about when Stephen Moffat took over, and the Russell era became nostalgia for people. It became basically impossible to criticise Russell's Doctor Who on the internet, believe me, I tried, because it existed as part of that bubble inside your head from the time before you had to get a job and start paying rent. Then Chris Chibnall took over as showrunner, and the Russell era became even more cemented as untouchable by comparison to what the show was doing in the present day. Russell was essentially deified on the internet, and to add to that, he spent most of the 2010s making some really interesting shows. So you think this is going to be it for Doctor Who, the Golden Boys returned, and all will be well for now. I'm expecting the new episodes to be incredibly successful, because Russell is the master of getting people to pay attention to whatever he does. But the reason I'm highlighting this caution that I'm entering the new period with is that when something is hugely successful, you can't call it good. Although this is not to say that being hugely successful makes something automatically good, and Doctor Who being as popular as it was back in 2008 could be a double-edged sword at times, particularly when it came to the subject of this video. After Season 4 was arguably the height of Doctor Who's critical and audience acclaim in the 21st century, they announced that David Tennant and Russell were leaving, and that there would be a series of specials to send off this era. Which, while they were as popular as ever and got eye-wateringly high ratings compared to where the show sunk in recent years, these specials don't really get talked about that much anymore. People say, yes, I love the 10th Doctor's era, you know, Blink, Silence in the Library, Journey's End, it was so good. But they don't really talk about this post-season 4 period that much. So given I'm predicting that we're inevitably going to enter a new era of fans having tedious shouting matches on the internet, I'm going to revisit a time when that was happening on a regular basis, with the arse end of the Tenant era, accompanied in my watch-throughs by John Granston, Billy Tracy, and Richard B. Brooks, of Five Who fans, who in case you didn't know, have relaunched their channel. Go watch them do it now. After finishing this video, of course. Full commentaries are, as ever, available on my Patreon. So to start out with, cast your minds back to Christmas 2008. So, Christmas 2008. Russell and David had just announced that they were leaving, and the special that year would be called The Next Doctor. The title referring to a character in the episode that the Doctor runs into, played by David Morrissey, who claims to be the Doctor, presumably from the future. I'm the Doctor. Simply the Doctor. The one, the only, and the best. The fact that Bookies even had odds on it turning out that David Morrissey was the actual next Doctor, and there was even discussion about this at all, is proof of just how broad the audience for Doctor Who was in 2008, because those of us in the know who were familiar with the way this format works, knew for a fact that this was just a gimmick to get people to pay attention. The one thing that I do like is that David Morrissey isn't really trying to do a David Tennant impression. Yes, that's true. Like, the dialogue helps as well, he doesn't Apart from a few moments like the screwdriver bit, he, he is talking like an Edwardian gentleman, uh, which helps kind of differentiate his performance. Sort of hints to you that he is from this time period. Yeah, yeah. 
I think Doctor Who was just in the place where it was too big to fail at this point, wasn't it? Uh, absolutely. This is, you know, again, after Journey's End, which got 12, 12 and a half million viewers, more viewers than the rest of the season beforehand. Like, I just remember that week, that week after uh, The Stolen Earth, before Journey's End, suddenly people talking to me at school. John, you know about Doctor Who. What's happening? It's all, it was uh, all like BBC and, News. Fuck yeah, it was everywhere, channel. really. And that's the thing. The, you, you know, normies didn't really understand the show, so there was so that was why there were those bookies going around saying, is that David Morrissey going to be the new Doctor? Yeah. Whereas yeah. we all thought, no, of course not, duh. Yes. Like, well, they wouldn't introduce him just in a random, a random Christmas special like that as part I of the plot. Maybe I did, but I'm an idiot. So you've got this Edwardian guy who's had his brain scrambled and he believes he's the Doctor, and that's burying memories of his wife getting killed by Cybermen and his son getting kidnapped. Okay, strong emotional hook, really solid. The only problem is you're throwing that on top of a vat of sugary nonsense containing little cyber monkey things, which are basically just blokes in masks and fur coats, and a giant Cyberman that comes out of the Thames firing lasers over London which is easily one of the dumbest sequences in all of Doctor Who, and considering the previous Christmas special was about a giant space Titanic almost crashing into Earth, that's saying a lot. Mm. I love that she's like, with this big Cyberman and my imagination will be rulers of everything, and like, her big imagination is like, let me fire a big laser cannon at some buildings and shit. Like, yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what I'd do if I had a big sumpy robot, well done. The Cyberman wouldn't have thought of that though. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no. You know, because they need human imagination. <laughs> that is genius, Miss Hartigan. We will make you a big robot. <laughs> I was close to feeling something with the fake Doctor sequences, where we basically stop the episode so everyone can go, so how do you feel? Which is a style of storytelling that I've wrongly credited to Chris Chibnall, apparently. But basically every scene of the Jackson Lake stuff feels like a conclusion to a character arc instead of a component of one. So the Doctor gets introduced to the fake Doctor, prods at his sense of self over the course of them discovering Cybermen in Victorian London, and then we find out what's happened to Jackson Lake at about the 30 minute mark. I mean, sure it's a foregone conclusion for people like myself and fellow Doctor Who nerds that Jackson Lake isn't the actual Doctor, but that destruction of his sense of self shouldn't come here at the midpoint, should it? Because if you've put that destruction of his sense of self here, everything after this is going to feel like an afterthought. Oh, he's also got a dead wife. Oh, he's also got a child that got kidnapped. And and ch children, children are more sad than dead wife. <laughs> his son, who's just standing there... Gormless. <laughs> so, uh, so now we've just added a kid thing in like two minutes. Yeah, it's already resolved, like done. It's, al it's already done. This is a series of dramatic skits. It's not an arc. Um, um, See, I, th I think I'm trying to think of how I would improve this. I think what I would do is I would strip out Miss Hartigan, strip out the Simon entirely, make this guy think that he's the Doctor, and think that he's being stalked by an alien, but he's actually not. Yeah. Much simpler. Yeah, just focus in, just, just solely focus in on the character. My fear there is there isn't a draw for the, the kids. No, that's true. Uh, maybe if there's like just one Cyberman. Like, just, yeah, just, true. I suppose, I suppose I'm thinking in terms of what I would want to watch as opposed to what a 10 year old would want to watch. This is the thing, right? This is the balancing act it's trying to make. Aside from that, I also sincerely question the Doctor's methods to get him to snap out of it. Isn't this the Doctor essentially giving someone a therapy session? Yes, essentially. That's not how you do therapy. You don't just go, Your entire life is a lie! <laughs> You're not me! I'm me! <laughs> <laughs> It's like, if, it's like if, someone, if someone is saying that, you know, there's a comedic example, I am Napoleon. The yeah. therapist doesn't just come in and say, You're not Napoleon. Stop being stupid. It, it, yeah. I mean, it could be worse. Like, imagine if it was, I don't know, like Colin Baker. <laughs> or like C Series 8 Capaldi. <laughs> oh, God. Coming in like, You stupid! You fool! <laughs> you don't even have a wife anymore, idiot! You've got a pudding brain, you moron! Of course, I suppose this tonal whiplash is nothing new. The Christmas specials were always an odd mix of some of the dumbest shit you've ever seen and emotional edge. 
Voyage of the Damned kills most of its incidental characters. The Doctor, the Widow and the Wardrobe is about a mother trying to come to terms with the fact her husband's gone missing in the war. And yes, all that other stuff. And pretty much all of the Christmas specials go at this breakneck pace where nothing's allowed to land. It doesn't give a single development a minute to just sit with you. Yeah, it's been about 15 minutes and there's been about... 12 scenes so far? Yeah. It was about here that I remember I was pretty much done with the Christmas specials because a pattern had been set in stone by this point. Stylistically, they have to be very different from the main show because they're made in the knowledge that the amount of people watching them would be higher than usual. You got 10 year olds, teenagers, parents, grandparents. These episodes were supposed to be Christmas TV for everybody, but if you're making something for everybody, it also ends up being for nobody in particular. So someone like me can't cling on to the emotional drama that I wanted out of the Jackson Lake storyline because it's thin and diluted by the giant robot stuff that's there for the 10 year olds. And the result is it's cringe inducing for anyone outside of the 10 year old age bracket, regardless of whether it's actually trying to do something for the older audience that's also watching. It's that whole, you know, the whole argument of, you know, is, is Doctor Who a kids TV show? Like it's a family drama at the end of the day, isn't it? Well, they sort of went more kid-friendly on the Christmas specials. Yeah, yeah this is definitely... A like, this feels like a pantomime not watching. Yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah. This is very pantomime, yeah. Here's something I remember about this episode on broadcast, is thinking to myself, I don't like Doctor Who at Christmas anymore, because it has to be kind of this heightened stupid. Uh, and mm. Doctor Who is stupid. Like I, I'm not going to pretend at any point that Doctor Who is absolutely ridiculously stupid but like this is like to a level where i'm like okay i i, I kind of can't i have to grit my teeth watching this or go into a room on my own and be away from the family because this is embarrassing to watch it's like they know everyone's watching at christmas so they want to go in with as much of what they have as possible which you know maximum bombast yeah, which ends up being a kind of a detriment because I don't think it necessarily makes the best impression. Yeah, this was. I do remember this being sort of the start of the beginning of the end for the Christmas specials for me. But leading up to the point where in Time of the Doctor, no one else was interested in it, so I was literally watching it with my girlfriend's father. <laughs> <laughs> that was a fun evening. <laughs> <laughs> He didn't say anything at the end of it. <laughs> oh no! He just got up and left. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! I mean, I would nitpick the rest of it and how whatever the hell is going on doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but you know I'm not that type of YouTube critic. And it is at least funny stupid, instead of just stupid stupid. Ass. <laughs> I mean, there's a, there's a very big... Oh, there we go. <laughs> this this is... There we go. I mean, you could put this next to Love and Monsters, and there's not much in it, is there? What are they doing now? I haven't been paying attention. Oh, they're taking the children to the workhouse. To basically, they're going to use to, to, to they're going to use the children uh, to power not the cyber factory, the cyber king, <gasps> big old Cyberman, powered by children. <laughs> And the doctor's going to come and save all the children yeah. from having yes. to do some wheel, to pull some wheels. <laughs> from pulling some wheels. Why are they getting the kids to do this? The Cybermen are so strong, and they're just like walking <laughs> around supervising. Yeah, good... that's, that's that's the thing <laughs> I love the most about the Cybermen. They're so strong. I'm I'm curious about what he's done here, because he he's he's freed her mind a bit, but she's also got enough control over the technology to pop herself like she goes pop all her bones and internal or internal organs are evaporated and she goes pop here she goes she's going to go pop oh, pop. Oh, God. <laughs> pop goes the weasel there are some things that are just impossible to conceive and the thing that's impossible to conceive for me is the idea of like someone watching the episode and coming away from that and going like that was Spectacular television. My mind is blown. I had a really good time. I had a great oh my time. God. I d oh my god, I didn't know that I could feel so many different things. I could feel emotional for that character that his wife died or something and then he forgot his kid. And also just like, there was a massive robot walking over London. It was a big robot. 
Stomping on Christmas. And the Doctor fired a blue laser thing and then they all exploded because they were sad. And the woman, she went pop. Because she was sad. So that's what happens when you're sad. Was... <laughs> Easter 2009 saw the broadcast of the second farewell special, Planet of the Dead. In it, the Doctor runs into this lady who steals a priceless artefact from the British Museum while he's eating an Easter egg, because did you know that it is Easter? They then go through a wormhole to a desert planet on a bus with a bunch of incidental characters, oh and there's some giant flies in boiler suits and massive stingray things. You probably don't remember much about this one, and there is a reason for that. It's completely empty. Yeah, because like, like, we're about halfway through it now, and what's happened? So far, they've gone to another planet, and they've just sort of farted about on a bus for about 20 minutes. Um, before I die of old age, which in my case would be quite an achievement, so... Before I die of old age, yeah, that's, that's, the, the, that's the sentence I'm using yeah. to sum up this episode. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, move! The, move! Like, where are the... F Think of it like a seven-year-old going, and there, then there is a bug person, and there is a rhino person, and it's exciting. And the bug person becomes the Doctor's best friend, and they yeah. go and have a drink at the pub. How did they fucking miss that? They've been walking around there for ages! <laughs> well, it could have been a mirage, you know? Oh yeah, that big they metal structure. Be, they just happened to be looking in the wrong direction. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's kind of an and then they go on the alien spaceship moment. <laughs> well, the, this episode, the reason why this episode I think carries a lot of the kind of, we've seen this a hundred times before is uh, it is very generic Doctor Who, yeah. but it's also the the template of every fan film. Yeah. Mm. So you know it is that kind of just the, the go to of the Doctor shows up in a place and then they go to a different place and then there are monsters, but those monsters aren't the bad guys. There are other monsters and they've got to work together <laughs> to get out. <laughs> That is that is exactly every fan film. And then we have the Brigadier's son, who is called Steve, who is played by our friend called Steve. All Planet of the Dead really does is drop some characters in a desert, which for some bloody reason they shot on location in Dubai. The thing is though, how do I know this is Dubai if there's no caption that says Dubai 2009? <laughs> Granted, there are a couple of nice shots, you know, I can see the director using C-3PO and R2-D2 in their mood boards, but it honestly could have just been a studio and a green screen for all it matters. That and I did spend most of this episode noticing that it contains basically every flaw that people spent the Moffat and Chibnall eras complaining about. It's essentially a blueprint for both of their eras, which is what makes me think that maybe the consistent mistakes that ended up becoming trademarks of both those eras, you know, one note female characters, characters describing stuff that we can plainly see on screen, are just mistakes that anyone will end up making if they're tired. It's gone. Right in front of me, the bus has just gone. Yeah, we can see the bus has just gone. Thanks. Yeah, we were watching that. See this, is, see, this is the thing. Chibnall didn't even patent characters <laughs> saying the things the that obvious. we can plainly see out loud. So, Lady Christina D'Souza... Is that... What's her name? Lady Christina D'Souza? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. She's basically a prototype of every single female character from the Moffat era, isn't she? Uh, she is, yeah. yeah. She, she'll always talk to the Doctor when she thinks she knows best, or whatever the phrase was. Yeah. Might get in trouble for saying this, but I'd take someone as bland as Yaz over those characters any day. <laughs> Actually, I kind of agree with you there. Because while Planet of the Dead is shit, I will recognise that the making of it sounds like a nightmare. Then they drop a shipping container on the bus in the, the, in the port in Dubai. So they had to write into the script why it was busted. And I think from a production standpoint, it's impressive that Russell was able... To just be like, okay, how damaged is it? Let's look at that. Let me work that into the script. Well, that's more interesting than anything that happens in this episode. Yeah. So if it looks and sounds like it was written in a hurry and then held together with duct tape, that's probably because it was. What about you? Don't know. Don't have around Tina's. Who's Tina, your girlfriend? Not yet. Come on, everybody. Offer me some small character details that will make you seem like real people. <laughs> It's your only hope. What about you, Christina? Come on, audience, care about these people! <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Right, so unit have shown up. What are they going to do? Uh, what what unit does in every story? Fuck all. <laughs> They're going to shoot at the vortex. I I I hate unit. I hate unit. I don't understand why Doctor Who fans love unit. Unit shit. Unit's done nothing for this program. <laughs> I hate it. Wow. I mean, that's probably the strongest emotion you could have watching this episode. It reminded me of how shit unit is. There you go. <laughs> But I'm going to use that clip of you saying <laughs> you know, shit for the record. Go, oh, go for it. I... Well, see, John, unit are doing something now. They're shooting at the fish things, <sighs> and that, and that the bus apparently. <laughs> like, how shit are they at shooting? <laughs> We're on another world. We have been for quite a while. I know, but seeing it like that, it's good, isn't it? Okay, that's a that that's a justifiable character says what they see line. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, because she's actually experiencing one of those human emotion things that they have these days. Newfangled, expensive city. So do you know what emotions are? They're like happiness. What? Sad, happy, sad. That's crazy talk, Stu. Awestruck. I know what a happy meal is. Is that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, John. <laughs> This episode successfully conveys both of mankind's two emotions. <laughs> I've got sand in my hair. That's dead people. Oh, that was disgusting. Oh. Okay, they could have got a better take of that. Oh, there's dead people in my hair. That's disgusting. Oh, no. It's like she's accidentally stepped in dog shit. Yeah. It just doesn't <laughs> yeah. work. She doesn't think of people as people. She's just like, yeah. ooh. That's the third emotion. I've stepped in dog shit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So those are mankind's emotions. There's <laughs> awestruck, happy, sad, stepped in dog shit. <laughs> Somehow, and I have my theories as to why this happened. Up until now, I had only ever watched Waters of Mars once, when it aired in two thousand and nine. And I wasn't the only one. Okay, so it's David Tennant's penultimate episode as the Doctor in which he goes to Mars and there's wet people. That's all I remember because I've only watched this episode once. Wow. I, yeah, I, am... I think I've only seen it once as well. Richard, so... Richard watched it once and went, that's the worst thing I've ever seen since Chris Chibnall's era. And spat I... it on the ground. <laughs> and, 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 and it was before Chris Chibnall's era even began. It was impressive. I... This is weird, because I watched Planet of the Dead Next Doctor in the End of Time multiple times over the years for various worst episodes of Doctor Who videos and podcasts I've made, because I knew I didn't like any of them, and I knew all the criticism points of those episodes I wanted to make, and I wanted to reinforce and reword them each time. It just goes to show the negative side of Doctor Who fans' obsessions, because I will admit that it is odd behaviour to watch the show's weaker episodes more often than the stronger ones. Although in my defence, when I watched it back when I was a teenager, I never thought of Waters of Mars as one of the strongest episodes of the revived show, which on reflection it very much is. I think part of the reason this one was undervalued was because we all knew Tennant and Russell were leaving, and we just wanted to get to the end of it. We just saw Waters of Mars as the penultimate story of this era, a stepping stone more than anything. On the surface it seems like just a base under siege story about some alien things that shoot water at people. I mean, yeah, the ending is incredibly heavy, but it came as part of a process more than a special occasion in its own right. Because when you stop and try and appreciate Waters of Mars for what it is, especially from my present day context of having been involved in film production, there is a lot to admire in this episode. It was surprising to find out just how good Waters of Mars was all these years later. We kept spotting these tiny little flourishes and attention to detail that were just truly inspired. Ooh. Ooh, that's pretty. That's nice, yeah, that's a real nice shot. See, I quite like this, that, you know, they're on Mars, and this is just a nice scene of just some gardeners, like, digging up some carrots. The first carrots on Mars. Isn't it nice? It's really nice. Here's a, here's a little thought. Do you think at some point during the script they thought maybe to make the water, like, black or viscous or something? Probably. Do you... I think that's a bit more obvious. I think it works better like this. Yeah. yeah, I prefer, yeah, because it's, it's that simple thing of kids after this will not want a glass of water. Yeah, because yeah that'll water, earn them. That'll earn them. There's a generation of, of young adults now who can't see in the dark and refuse to drink water, and it's because of this episode. Yeah. I've not had a bath since 2009. Thanks, <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, we know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but like so this wet. bit as well. Like this character, she's had what, 10, 15 lines of dialogue through the episode? And then her final death is so beautifully Oh god, cruel. yeah, it's brutal. <laughs> so simple, but so effective. And that's the beauty as well of just making it water. It's And the Doctor can't do anything. The hero is walking away, listening to each and every one of these people die. It's also interesting to note that David Tennant's performance is probably his least Doctorish in this episode, and definitely his best. A lot of the Doctor's exchanges with Adelaide in Waters of Mars are these small, intimate, soft moments between the characters that work their hardest to get you more invested for when the pace picks up again. But yeah, those moments where he is a bit more human, those moments where he breaks through... Yeah, because there is the... a degree to which the, the Doctor is a pantomime character. Yes. I think there's something to be said for like writing the Doctor like not as the Doctor, if that makes sense. David Tennant just seems to do quite well when he's not written to say anything doctory. See, I'm I'm realizing I'm realizing here how much I've missed this. This scene has been going on for about like five minutes, and it's just the Doctor and an incidental character just standing there talking and like sharing their emotions. It's fantastic. It, it's not going at about like fifty fucking lines a second. No, and when and we've not cut to Montreal for some reason. <laughs> and the important thing is that David Tennant shuts up for quite a lot of it. His mouth is not moving, he's just listening to her. The Doctor never listens to people. No. He's always talking over people and talking about, look at, look at how cl clever I am. I did a clever thing. There's that scene in, um, uh, what's the one with um, the master played by Derek Jacobi? Utopia. Utop Utopia, that's it. Captain Jack is in the big radiation room and David Tennant's having a chat with him. Yes. Something about David Tennant's performance there, that was just my favourite bit of David That's, Tennant. Mm. That is similar to what happens later, to be fair. The okay. best way to get a David Tennant performance is to put the conversation between a door and a small window. Yeah. <laughs> and then He can't be in the same room with anyone else. <laughs> That's how you get the best out of him. Everyone knows that. Otherwise, he chews up the scenery. That's why staged worked so well, because he was on a tiny screen. <laughs> We've cracked it. We've cracked David Tennant. There are four more standard action procedures, and action five is... Detonation. The final option. Okay, fine. I'll take this scene seriously. <laughs> <laughs> For the first time. <laughs> you know, I'm leaving soon, so I might as well take one scene seriously. In fact, Waters of Mars was so good that for a large chunk of it, we all just vanished into the story and forgot to talk about it. Usually the way these commentaries work is something happens on screen that gives us either a tangent or an opportunity for a joke, because, you know, this is online content, we go into making it with an awareness that you are supposed to find it entertaining. But it was kind of hard to find anything to joke about in this one. What did everyone have for lunch? cheap <laughs> <laughs> Nice. I had leftover Pump pizza. Sandwich. Cheese sandwich. Oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, this is the problem with putting it so close to the present, because if we're not on Mars in 2059, everyone's going to be like, Ah! You didn't predict the future, did you? You're an idiot, Russell T. Davis. You got it wrong! So, well, it's such a coincidence, isn't it? They all died in the same year. <laughs> I wonder why that is. Leave that man alone, Andy. As I'm asking you to take away. your hand away I from him and listen to me. How do you think they achieved that? Did they, did they shove a hose up people's bums? Yeah, right up the but bum. There, there's a hose g going around the cheek of, of the mouth. It's also interesting that the water monsters themselves are unexplained. They don't even get a name said out loud in the duration. Apparently they're called the Flood. They're this strange presence that just infect the crew members who then stand by this sheet of ice at the end. And it's actually quite an eerie and anomalous image that works a lot better years later, now when I've disentangled myself from the lore of Doctor Who and am much happier with the water monster's true intent being left up to my imagination. Yeah, but there's also an Ice Warrior reference. Oh. Yes. I think you would find maybe 50% of fans think that this story would be improved if the Ice Warriors showed up. 
Oh, and that's no. everything that's wrong with the Doctor Who fandom. Is there not? That's uh, not a controversial uh, opinion. I agree with that one hundred percent. That that one is not controversial. <laughs> Precious moment. Everything else is in flux. Anything can happen, but those... Oh, oh flux, flux reference. <laughs> <laughs> it was seated all the way back in 2009. Chris Chibnall is a genius. Waters of Mars shocked me with how good it was, even before the shocking ending. One of the darkest moments in all of Doctor Who. Like, so dark that I probably shouldn't even go near it in this video for fear of bringing your mood down while watching this, because it's just bleak. The ending of Waters of Mars is kind of symptomatic of why it passed both me and Richard by at the time, because it was so out of place in the context of late 2000s British TV, and especially in the context of the biggest popular BBC drama in 2009. Nowadays Waters of Mars would fit better into the media landscape that isn't afraid to be a bit bleak sometimes. This episode's kind of like Doctor Who done as an A24 film. Yes, it is very much a Doctor Who episode, but it's got a more mature filter over it. One thing I loved in particular was this very real and human reaction that a crew member has to the TARDIS being bigger on the inside. What is that thing? It's... bigger. I mean, it's bigger on the inside. Like she's having existential crisis. <laughs> oh my god, that's what, I've, like... that's what I've wanted from someone who's gotten inside the TARDIS for so long. Like, oh my god, it's bigger on the inside. Fuck, I'm... Fuck, I'm going crazy! All in all, Waters of Mars was completely ahead of its time, and it's the template of what Doctor Who probably should look like in the 2020s. Whether Russell's done that remains to be seen, but this is why it sat wrong in 2009, and it's probably part of why I didn't recognise it for what it was at the time, because it was so different. And it does still sit wrong alongside the next one. This story, what he does at the end of this story is meant to directly be the catalyst for the end of time, except it's not at all. It's not at all. Yeah, I think this story, it feels like it's being plucked from a different series. Like I like The End of Time and I like this story um, as well, but I don't think they, they really work together. So this episode sets in stone that everyone in this story is supposed to die. The Doctor is all moody and bleak for the duration, then he snaps and tries to save them. Birdie fails, and the episode ends all sad. So you'd think the start of the next one would continue with that same tone, but it doesn't. And then when that happened in, in this episode, we were kind of expecting that, the pathos of that, yeah, to have some kind of impact going into the next episode. And yeah. then David Tennant comes out of the TARDIS with a fucking laurel well, around his neck saying, oh, look, I've got, a, I've, got a, I've got a beeper on the TARDIS when I lock it now. Guess what? I banged the coin. Good Queen Bess. And let me tell you, her nickname is no longer... And then there was like a charity thing or, or, or like a few weeks before End of Time and they they showed that scene of him walking out on, on the Ood Sphere being all happy clappy. And I was like, that's not what happened at the end of the episode I just watched. The End of Time has been a bit of a punch bag among Doctor Who nerds for years now, but when looking back and trying to understand why, I think the biggest problem with it is the title. That's a really big and epic sounding name implying the stakes are as high as they can possibly go. But the problem the episode runs into is, how do you depict that? I realised when it was on that, how can you physically portray the idea of a, a non-corporeal concept of time ending because i watched it and i was just sort of like where's the threat so what what does time ending look like do, do, did you is... need to see like Russell on holding a hammer over an alarm clock yeah that's what, <laughs> that's what I, that's what i was thinking i'm going to do it doctor no Russell, um... please people need to wake up tomorrow it's actually surprising because I've been rewatching old Futurama recently, and there's an episode in which time there's all these time skips, and the way the professor explains it is: by Tuesday it will be Thursday, by Wednesday it will be August, and by Thursday it will be the end of existence as we know it. And I just thought that's actually a better way of explaining how yes. time will end than yes. Doctor Who achieved here. So it kind of makes sense that for the most part, the end of time isn't actually about the end of time. Most of part one is to do with the master coming back to life and getting involved with this machine owned by these weird incesty billionaires. It transmits the medical template across the entire population. 
And that will cause the end of time somehow. No, no, the end of time is already happening. Oh, the end of time is a different thing. The end of time is already happening, this is just... Window dressing. The plot. This is just the plot of the episode now. <laughs> you bore his imprint. That's what we needed. The final biometrical signature. What if this goes wrong and she's put a napkin in it and it just comes out as a big napkin? <laughs> <laughs> Throughout part one, I was struggling to understand how and why time was supposed to be coming to an end. Okay, so the Time Lords obviously have something to do with it, because they're this super powerful race of alien beings who call themselves the Lords of Time, but the Time Lords aren't really woven into the narrative all that well. It's just a case where Rassilon occasionally interrupts the story with a bit of voiceover and it sounds all big and booming and theatrical. It just makes me think this story probably started life as a separate piece that's just about the Master and the Incesti billionaires that had the Time Lords bolted onto it because everyone expected the finale to be this big, high-scale piece that brought the Time Lords back. I might be misremembering some details about what we've been told about this episode prior to broadcast, but there seemed to be this general understanding that because it was the last episode of Russell's run, and most episodes have brought up the Time War every five minutes or so, that in the last episode of it, it would address the Time War, and the Time Lords would be in it in some capacity. My point, though, is that they arrive on Earth at about 38 minutes into Part 2, and then they're gone again at about 50. The bulk of this story is about the Master, using this machine to make everyone on Earth into the same person, in... the dumbest thing the show ever did. I feel like throughout these specials I've just been saying over and over again, okay, no, this is the dumbest thing that happened in Russell T. Davies' Doctor. No, this is the dumbest this thing that's happened it. in Russell T. Davies' Doctor. Here it is! Here comes his Here face! It is. There Here it is! Here it is, big dumb thing. But now, there is no human race. There is only the master race. Oh ah. God, cringe! Ah. Ah, God. So I suppose this is a this is a true Christmas special then, because it's all in service of a shit dad joke. <laughs> look how funny it is, and the music is going, so and everyone's stupid. look, everyone's the master, <laughs> and the so music. Dumb. The music's telling you how- It goes how... on for so long. Look how epic this is! It's a bunch of people! How terrifying! It's so scary! How terrifying! This estate in London is just the master! Oh my goodness, how dramatic! They're all the same guy! <laughs> I, I don't know what- <laughs> What am I looking at? This is utter- Imagine if this is your first episode. Oh I do kind of like so that they one up the the climax by saying, "Oh, but here's Tim Dalton." Yeah, I do like that. Oh, by the way, if you think that's weak, don't worry. Here's the big one. That being said, there is always this question of just how much you should show of the Time Lords. The old show had this problem a lot. You reveal too much of them, and the Time Lords become stuffy and boring. Leave them at a distance, and they retain this level of mystique. And yet this episode somehow finds a way of retaining the level of mystique while also disappointing people at the lack of texture to the Time Lord's world, now that we live in the age of the internet, where everything has to be over-explained and have relevant wiki pages offering supporting backstory. Nothing can be left up to the viewer's imagination anymore. Again, like, even, Deadly, I, I, even Deadly Assassin though, it's just sort of it wanders away about halfway through and it's like, okay, let's go into the Matrix and do something weird and trippy. But that's it. It's like, no one actually wants to go close to the Time Lords and do something with them because they because when you do, it's just sort of uh, oh, they're, they're just boring, aren't they? I, know. I mean, the trick yeah. is to not make them boring. I like it. I do <laughs> find it funny. I don't. I can't remember which interviews I've re I've, I've read where like um, you'll have writers saying like, oh, the Time Lords. The problem is with the Time Lords when you introduce them is that they they're actually really boring. And it's like, well, just don't. Have you considered not making them boring? And I know that's like. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds really petty of me, but like you are writers, and writers write things, <laughs> and like you can, you could do whatever you want, can't you? Okay, yeah. you know, how, you do. Yeah, yeah, that does sort of sound like you know how you always do bad things. Why don't you just try doing good things? Hey, how about <laughs> yeah, have yeah. you thought about that? Now that I'm older and appreciate ambiguity in my storytelling, I kind of like that this unnamed time lady shows up throughout the story to just prod at events. She's a mysterious unnamed player whose motives are unspoken. It's the Doctor's mum. She never gets revealed to be the Doctor's mum. It's the Doctor's no. mum, shut up. It's it, no, it's, it's, te 
Tektuin. 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 No, she worked at the Gallifrey gift shop. In <laughs> <laughs> a bottle universe. See, when when I was younger and a more obsessive fan, I wanted to know who that lady was, but now I'm older and appreciate ambiguity. I kind of like that she's just this weird, mysterious presence. Yeah. It's kind of Twin Peaksy, yes. isn't it? Yeah. That's one of the things that Chibnall did right. Like, there was no point where he was like, so, Tectoon, were you that woman in the end of time? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that solved a lot of things on the Doctor Who wikia, but... Yeah, I mean, if any showrunner was going to do it, it was Chris Chibnall, so like, I appreciate his restraint there. <laughs> and that would literally be the way he would write that dialogue. <laughs> so, Tectoon, were you that woman? We're in space! See, that was a that, that was another nice one of those. This is a character. This is justifiable. Character says what they see. Line. Sure. The character says what they see. They've got to like have an emotion. Damn, Chris Chibnall's taking notes there. Learned the wrong lesson. Say what you see. And those missiles could hit the spaceship, and then the spaceship would blow up. And if we <laughs> blow up, Yaz will die. Oh no, Doctor, that's not good. <laughs> That's we'll properly come with uncomfortable. Me. Stop standing and looking at the world. <laughs> this way, through this door. <laughs> run <laughs> faster. <laughs> to run, you need to move your legs. How many pipes like... are there, Doctor? Should we start counting them? <laughs> there are five red pipes and seven yellow pipes. <laughs> that looks like a very dangerous catwalk. There's not even a fucking barrier or anything. No, that's quite Star Warsy. <laughs> Imagine the risk assessments you'd have to do do when you're designing that thing. This just goes to show the grown-up in me. Now, when I was a kid, I was like, wow, Time Lord's Gallifrey. As an adult, I'm just like, the fucking risk assessments, man. <laughs> <laughs> I did actually find myself enjoying the end of time a lot more than I used to, now that I don't give a shit about canon anymore. I can just let myself bask in the performances. Like this phenomenal scene in the cafe in part one, where Wilf and the Doctor sit down and Ten gives a rather melodramatic reading of regeneration, that hits incredibly differently when watching it in 2023, considering who he's saying it to. I feel like this scene was what this episode was written for. Yeah. Mm. Nice and quiet as well. I'm going to die. Well, so am I one day. Don't you dare. Oh. Oh, oh don't no. no. He will knock four times. I don't know if I'm emotionally ready to see Bernard Cribbins again. The cafe scene is gold and honestly very out of kilter with the rest of the runtime of part one, which is this big loud sequence of calamitous noises to emphasize just how important this story is. El Rassanon is a watery boy. He's got a moist mouth. Oh, Gallifrey. <laughs> oh, yeah, you can see it coming out, yeah. Mm. Dinner Well, over a decade later, I still shout dinner time like that. Yeah. Like, that was <laughs> the impact that this has left we're, on me. We're me, that, Billy, that, and that Dad that live shot together. was some anime shit right there. I love well, the I master do... can fly now. I think so. He can fly and eat. He can fly and eat really fast. Imagine if the master just ate the doctor right now. <laughs> <laughs> just gobbled him up. Just oh. dislocated his jaw and just swallowed him up like a python. Oh no! Part one is also very out of kilter with part two, which is strangely quiet for a series finale. Part 1 rarely, if ever, shuts up for a minute, and then Part 2 has a lot of these soft interactions and quieter music. And when I realised that, that was the point where it became obvious why Part 1 couldn't have tonally followed the heaviest fuck ending of Waters of Mars. Because End of Time Parts 1 and 2 were made for broadcast TV, and broadcast TV has to take into consideration the audience that will be watching it on day of broadcast. And The End of Time Part 1 was a Christmas special, and the Christmas specials have to be this heightened level of bombastic and stupid because everyone's drunk and eaten too much on Christmas Day. And End of Time Part 2 is a New Year's Day special, so the audience will be in a different mindset. I'm struck by how much quieter this episode is than Part 1. Mm. 
Because it was written for New Year's Day, everyone's got a hangover. Keep watching, Doctor. I know you've got a hangover, that's why I'm whispering. Okay, now it's loud. This wouldn't be good for people's hangovers. Yeah. But by now yeah, you've turned had... the TV on now. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of got that that vibe of the sort of thing you'd watch at this time of year, though. You know, like Star Wars or Indiana Jones. Yeah, yeah true. It's all, all right, hungover, it's all right, hungover people. The doctor's going to fire a big laser. Bernard Krebins is going to fire master a laser. Is, the master has fired one hundred thousand squishmallows at us. <laughs> <laughs> So are they making Gallifrey crash into Earth or something? Yeah, they're bringing Gallifrey... That's got to come back somewhere. Somewhat. <laughs> Does it? <laughs> I don't know. Where are they running? <laughs> Where would you be running? <laughs> <laughs> this is fucking... Okay, this is stupid now. It's this, so this dumb. Fucking... Oh my god. I, can't, I don't like this Wait, at Everyone all. run away from... <laughs> away... <laughs> That was everyone from earlier that was like running away. Where did they? Did they all just like run back? Yeah, they were running in circles. We're looking for Donna. It, it's kind of a good simulation of a hangover in that respect. It's just like they're running at their house. <laughs> Fucking hell! There was a planet. It was falling into Earth, and now it's not. What the fuck? It's a Christmas miracle. But if the time lock's broken, then everything's coming through. Not just the Daleks, but the Scarrow degradations. The, the mighty slumbles of the. Plimby splimbles. <laughs> <laughs> the pibble squeaks and their vorpal swords. The people with the damp socks. <laughs> what are they? What are they? I want. I want to. I want to see the people with the damp socks. They're just people with damp socks. <laughs> <laughs> they, they make your socks wet, and it's really uncomfortable. <laughs> you can't take your shoes off. And then at the end of this hangover of an episode, it makes everyone cry by spending about 20 minutes having the Doctor, who's supposed to be dying, isn't he? Go back and visit all of the companions from this era, which I thought was overindulgent back in the day, and it still is now. This was kind of like the era of Twilight, wasn't it, where stalking someone is apparently romantic. Come on, die already. Yeah, that's what everyone was saying in my house. It, it, it kind of feels very, like, scientifically engineered to pull as much on your heartstrings as possible. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going for the Disney emotional yeah. approach. This well. is for people who, like, cry at the coronation, isn't it? Oh, please don't. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just had the mental image of, like, the Tenth Doctor, like, turning up at the Queen's funeral going, Thank you, Mom! <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Could you imagine, like, a long queue? A long queue of all the companions and the enemies to, to see the Doctor's corpse. <laughs> I would, you know, you know, if we if we're talking wanky, pretentious, elongated goodbyes, I would prefer that. So, what have we learned here today? Oh yeah, we were supposed to have learned something, weren't we? Um, shit, was it? Um, come up with a conclusion. Um, okay, so it's unlikely that these final episodes of Russell's first era as showrunner are going to really inform his new era at the helm. I mostly just wanted to do this project just to take the piss, really. I am hoping that, on reflection, Russell has seen The Waters of Mars for the potential template that it should be, but the likelihood of that is quite low because it was so uncharacteristic of the Tenth Doctor's era. That with the 60th they got the 10th Doctor, Donna and Wilf back, signalling that we're supposed to go into the 60th anniversary with this expectation that it'll make us feel like it used to. But to be honest, if it doesn't make me feel like I used to, I'll kind of be glad. With the time and distance and change in my tastes, the way I viewed at least the end of Time and Waters of Mars was entirely different from the way I watched Doctor Who in 2009 as an obsessive little fanboy who let his encyclopedic knowledge of this universe engulf almost everything else about the experience. There was a lot more that I could appreciate this time around. This experience of re-evaluation has actually made me more optimistic for what comes after the 60th, when Russell offers me something new that I can appreciate with fresh eyes and no baggage, and hopefully everyone else will too. 
I mean, it's unlikely, given the indeterminate ball of rage that this fandom has been for decades, but, you know, it's at least theoretically possible. Anyway, yeah. he- he- hello, p- person lis- listening to this. I-, I am Stuart. Hi, Stu. Hello, Stuart. <laughs> Hi. Hey, that Stu. Was, that was the cue for everyone else to introduce themselves because I can't be bothered <laughs> to do it this time. It's lovely Any- to be here, Stuart. I'm-, I'm here with John, Billy, and Richard as as usual. Okay. Thank you for listening to this. <laughs> people who've been listening to this. Thanks, Stu. Um, Th- th- thank you, Richard and John. You're not me. Well, some S- Billy so, was here too. Billy was Billy was here too. Uh, we've all, we've all had a snuggly chibnall time today. You What's know, your snuggly chibnall moment of the day, Stu? <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the the blue one. <laughs> the blue one. <laughs> Controversial. <laughs> Controversial, but brave. That's a commercial. <laughs> okay, I'm pressing stop now.